Okay, welcome everybody. We've made it to session five of our book study. Thank you all for um, continuing to show up and have a good discussion. Um, again, our end time is 8.30, but um, if we're having a really <clears throat> good discussion and wanna stay on um, about 15 minutes more, I'll keep the Zoom meeting open until 8.45. Um, Susan, do you have a prayer? I do. Father John and I talked about this. This is a meditation that he found during another study that we, we shared. And uh, we talked this afternoon and thought it was a good time to use this. <laughs> so let's all just take a deep breath and um, and just, just think about the God presence that's in us and all around us. To be enlightened is to be in touch with God, the God within and around us, more than it is to be engulfed, <clears throat> excuse me, in any single way, any one manifestation, any specific denominational or nationalistic construct, however good and well-intentioned those may be. It is a practice in many monasteries to turn and bow to the sister walking in procession with you after bowing to the altar as you enter chapel for prayer. The meaning of such a monastic custom is clear. God is as much in the world around us, as much in one another, as on that altar in the chapel. Okay. God is the stuff of our lives, the breath of our very souls, calling us always to a heightened understanding of life, all its forms. To be enlightened is to know that heaven is not. Hey, Susan, I accidentally muted you. I'm sorry. No worries. Um, to be enlightened is to know that heaven is not coming. Heaven is here. We have simply not been able to realize that yet because like King Arthur and his search for the Holy Grail, we look in all the wrong places, worship all the wrong idols, get fixated on all the wrong notions of God. We are always on our way to somewhere else when this place, the place in which I stand right now, wherever it is, is the place of my procession into God, the site of my union with the life that gives life. Many of you may have uh, recognized that as the words of Joan Chittister. Um, and uh, this is from The Illuminated Life. And she talks about how we can be monastic, we can have monastic wisdom even in the midst of very busy lives. So hopefully in our discussions, we'll realize that God is in each of us. And I think that's a huge, a huge, just a huge truth that may help us to combat racism. It certainly should. Earlier today, I listened to a podcast by, uh, by Richard Rohr. And you may be familiar with him. He's a Franciscan who lives in uh, New Mexico, written a lot of books. And he said something that really, he says a lot of good things, but something really resonated with him. He said, as Catholics and Christians, we spend too much time talking about original sin, chapter three of the book of Genesis, and not enough time talking about original goodness, chapters one and two of Genesis. And he said, every time God created something, he said, and it is good, and it is good, and it is very good. So um, if we can meet each person in that spirit, that will help us along our journey, I think. Okay, I, I'm really excited to be with you all. I always feel energized after our sessions because I learn a lot from your sharing. So if, um, if you, I don't know if you look at your syllabus or not, it doesn't matter. If you don't, I don't care. But the first question on there, in case people wanted to um, look at the syllabus, is uh, when have race issues become personal for you? 
um, maybe take a minute to mull that over and see if you have anything to share with the group. Because tonight's chapters are all about how this systemic racism functions in our lives. I guess he's a, I'm pretty sure I don't as well. Father John, Father John's here, so we'll, we have barely started, Father. I read the, um, you can take your mask off. We've got, we've got our, um, I'm going to give Paul the, Can you, can you forward it to me? That's right there. Okay. Okay. I, I would like to start if no one else has anything. Earlier in the session, I talked about a student I have had named Unika who walked into my class on her first day of school, two and a half months into my, my uh, days of school in that school year because she didn't start till October. And she walked into school and sat down and in the very beginning of the class, she's coming over her desk at me saying, Miss Sherman's a racist. And all the kids came to my defense. <clears throat> what a shame. She's the one who was hurt by racism. And because of my white fragility, I was busy defending myself, feeling affirmed by what the students said. See, I'm not a racist. They said I'm not a racist when I should have been concerned about the pain my student was feeling. It's her first day of school. And her first reaction is, Mrs. Sherman is a racist. And I was so busy denying my racism, I didn't see her pain. And that's pretty unfortunate. That's how I am complicit in racism. And the chapters we read this week talk about that a lot. They talk about the feelings that racism evokes. Paul, I forward it to you. Okay. And um, they talk about the feelings and then what we do with those feelings and then the assumptions we make. So we will want to talk about some of that. <clears throat> but has any of y'all had any really personal experiences of racism? Maybe not with your own racism, but racism you observed, racism you felt, racism you encountered. Can you hear me? Yes. I'm Brenda again in Jeffersonville. Um, I think it became personal for me when I took a job with a all black uh, band. I was their sound engineer and then dated one of the guys in the band for like 12 years in the uh, 80s, 80s and 90s. It became very personal to see how they were treated for 12 years. <laughs> Can't hear you. You're muted again. I said, so in other words, you're saying you experienced their pain, the pain that racism caused them. Is that what you mean? <laughs> the way they were treated. <laughs> the way they were treated. What were some of those things? Well, um, I had a meeting. I had a band meeting at my apartment and the band came. We were having a meeting <clears throat> and shortly after that, and I was living in the east end of Jefferson of Louisville. And shortly after that, a claim, um, I had a note put on my car that said this has been an official, vi unofficial visit by the KKK. And then someone called my work and tried to get me fired. And they also tried to uh, have me evicted from my apartment. And um, we went to play in a, in a place in Canada. And when we got to the country club, the people didn't know they were a black band. And they said, oh, absolutely not. You people aren't getting out of your car. And we said, I said, well, just let them play a few songs. And if you don't like them, we'll leave. They loved us. They loved us. We were coming back from New York for a gig. We stopped in Columbus, Ohio to eat at a restaurant. And I'm sorry. We were uh, 
as we were leaving, we were attacked by a group of people that were dressed in ball uniforms, but they'd actually been to a Klan meeting. They chased us out of the city and they were beating our, our bus with bats. It was very terrifying. And when we got away and we knew we weren't being followed anymore, the band got out of the car, got in a circle and said a prayer for them. Wow. Um, how much uh, did uh, you process with them or they process with you that experience after it happened? Did you all talk about it much? You're, um, Unmute. you're muted, Brenda. Um, yeah, mainly with, yeah, we talked about it some. It was just shocking, all of it. Mm -hmm. Uh, Gary, you want to add the to times? That? It was the eighties and part okay. of the night. Gary, did you want to respond to that or share something else? Hi, everyone. I wanted to respond, and uh, I'd also already mentioned that I had been a Peace Corps volunteer in Congo in the eighties, kind of around the same time Brenda was talking about, but very different in Congo, of course, in how it's, of course, race is looked at very differently there. Um, and for white people are always thought to be wealthy, working for some company or for government, or as a missionary, I worked in a Protestant school there teaching English and I was always assumed to be one of the Protestant missionaries who would always uh, hire several people to work for them, to cook, to do the grass, to do their laundry. There was a whole, it was an expectation that they would do that. And I was, I was in that expectation too, but <laughs> it was a little different uh, given my salary. And overall my experiences were great, but I had to fight that that presumption about white people for the two years I was there. And it did get to be frustrating a few times that I was never looked at as just, you know, one of the regular kind of people. And um, since then, my son has come over here to live. He's been here about 11 years. It's amazing. Becoming a citizen. And um, during this class, I've, I mentioned it to him a few times and how he and I can continue to talk about these issues and how he's half black and he it's very different from him not growing up here, but he's felt um, the prejudice uh, that we often have here taken for granted a few times. And, um, and on my part, from my side, people usually assume that I've adopted him which is, of course, not what happened, but how there's a perception about white men and black women, uh, usually in that direction, unfortunately. So, but he and I continue to talk. That is my goal is to, you know, make his life uh, and, and his life in Africa too, as good as it can be. One thing about what, um what we, we've just heard is it reminds people and it's up to us to remind other people that this whole racism issue is alive and well. It's not ancient history by any means. And it's it's not even, uh, you know, decades ago. It's it's alive and well today. The other thing, the reason why I asked if if that horrific experience, if, if, if you all process that is um, for, a person who's African-American from that experience, having lived that their whole lives, it's not just that single incident that would be disturbing. It would dredge up all of the other incidences, all the other injuries of the past that they've lived their whole lives. And um, sometimes when all that gets dredged up, we don't, we don't want to talk about it. 
because it's like reliving so much of the pain and so much of the injury. And the other thing that I have said is uh, so much of it, it's still, the wounds are still there because there's been no measure of movement to bring any healing, okay? So we hear about it, we know about it, but the question is, how does anyone get any, any sense that there can be a healing from these wounds that have been inflicted on them? I think, um, when I think about my career as a Catholic school teacher for 50 years, I think of a very special lady who is African American. And um, about 35 years ago, I was teaching at St. Barnabas. And this lady came from St. George. She had been a principal there. And she was African-American. And um, we became friends very quickly because she was just an open-minded, hearted person, very sharp. And her goal was to become a, a Catholic school principal in an elementary school, which she was at St. George. She was their principal. But then St. George School got closed uh, by the archdiocese. So she got hired by St. Barnabas. Um, but I guess, you know, second week into knowing her at teachers meetings, she told me right away, she said, I really want to become a Catholic school principal. Can you help me uh, get to that point? And I said, sure, I'll help you do whatever you want to do. Because she had all the credentials. She already had a master's degree. She had experience, et cetera. So she stayed her first year at St. Barnabas and we taught together, et cetera. Well, there came an opening at a neighboring school, a principalship opening. And I said, oh my gosh, here's your opportunity, you know? And she said, will you write a recommendation for me? I said, sure. So I wrote her a recommendation. So did our principal plus her resume, you know, from her past experience. So we thought for sure she would get this job because I also knew two or three of the other people who were going after the job, okay? And, and I said, you know, just have a great interview and just tell them all that you've done in your whole career and I'm sure you will get that position. Well, guess what? She did not get that position. And I... I sort of lost it a little, you know, I went to my principal, I went to the pastor uh, who was Tony Heitzman at the time at St. Barnabas and Tony was upset as well, et cetera. And I, to this day, I have never, in my heart, I just really feel like she did not get that job because she was African-American and I, I thought we, we did not do her right. I mean, we, meaning the church, did not do that lady right. And so at the end of the year, of course, she said, I'm not going to stay in Catholic school. She said, I'm, I'm going to go to the public system because I know I can get a job right away in the public system as a principal. Mm -hmm. And I thought, what a great loss for us, for our schools, for our students, for everything. And I just feel like she didn't get that position because the pastor, the school board, they did not want to deal with the fact that she was African-American. I mean, I, I could rationally, I could not come to any other conclusion, uh, which may be unfair for me to say that, but, oh, I tell you, that was, a uh, tough, tough situation, but she went on to the county system, became an assistant principal at Atherton High School eventually, and then I think she retired. I sort of lost touch with her, um, I guess, in the last 10 years. We've, our past did not cross, so I just wanted to share that. Wonderful lady. 
someone can can um, react or respond to this, but my suspicion is it, it wasn't just the fact that whoever made the decisions didn't want to deal with her because she's an African American. They didn't want to deal with their constituency, meaning other teachers, parents, parishioners, et cetera, having an African American school principal. I suspect that was a big part of it too. Oh yeah, I, you know, it's, I totally agree with that father. You know, Catholic schools, um, we, we need to be very honest about saying we have to market ourselves. Mm -hmm. And it's, it, it's a reality, I realize that, but um, it, it gets me in the heart if that that becomes the reason why we pass up quality people because we don't want to deal with some of the donors, some of the people who give money to our institution. But mm -hmm. that's a reality. And I, I know that's a reality um, mm -hmm. anyway, but. Emily, do you have a like hand up, Emily? Yeah, I am. I just, I'm so glad Barbara shared that, that experience. And um, I, I don't, I, th I don't think there's any reason to assume anything other than that, that um, this extremely qualified, well-liked, special, precious person was overlooked because of what Father John Judy said, not just because she's black, but because the constituency that would have to be, um, that would be part of that conversation. And I think that's, it's hard sometimes I think I know for me and I cringe when I think about how many opportunities I've had to be an upstander you know I know Jefferson County Schools uh, spent some time a couple years ago talking about upstanding and 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 being the voice you know we can't assume that because a black woman or a black man is qualified in in all of way all of the ways that they need to be that that's enough that we that we should help find the channels to dig into uh, racial inequality, white fragility, and to use our voice. And Barbara, I'm I, I I've just it's so appreciated you sharing that. I can, like I said, I can think of so many times where I had an opportunity to have said something and I didn't. You know, sometimes because I didn't know that I could or that I should, and sometimes just because I didn't, you, you know, and that's embarrassing to admit. But um, I, what I've learned so much from this book is, you know, again, how to, how to speak out and that speaking out is important. Um, it's, it's okay for everyone to be uncomfortable. It's okay to, for white people in our interactions to be uncomfortable about being called on called out on their discomfort. And that's all I want to say. Thank you, Emily. In the chapter we read said, when we do speak out, we will encounter feelings and behaviors. And she gives us so many examples and they're very consistent with the examples that all of you shared, but it kind of prepares you <coughs> a little bit to realize that those reactions are white fragility more than anything. Hey, Susan, there's a little bit of an echo when you're talking. I don't know if you have two meetings yeah. at the same time or. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, you think we could go in different rooms? Or why don't you come over here with us? I'll okay. okay, we'll try to improve on that. This was uh, something that uh, Robin mentioned in chapter 10 of her book when she talks about white fragility and rules of engagement. Mm -hmm. You know, um, how people within the dominant culture react, respond, make decisions about things that protect and preserve the dominance of the culture. That's more important than what would be considered fair or just with whomever else they would be dealing with. And uh, it's about protecting the white dominance and obscuring the racism that is at play there. I think this was a prime example of that. Terry, do you have something you'd like to say?
I'm just wondering if, you know, has anyone else either observed this or, or encountered it in your own experiences? I'm not sure how this fits in with our current conversation because it's in my mind, I keep going around with different things, but um, near the end of this summer, um, I contacted um, one of the uh, assistant principals at a large public um, middle school who I've had contact with off and on over the past several years. He is an educated black man and um, I was concerning some of the families in the school that I had a group that wanted to help them. But we did took care of, and this was all on the phone. We took care of what we needed to do and, and information that I needed to see if we were gonna proceed with trying to uh, help a couple of these families. But as the conversation as we finished, I said to him, um, I, you know, would you, would, would you be, would you talk to me about how you feel about what's going on in our city of Louisville with the uh, protests and Black Lives Matter, because I would love to hear about it from your perspective. And um, the phone was dead silence. I, I was afraid that I'd offended him by asking the question or asking him to participate, you know, and I, I didn't know, I didn't know if I should break the silence or be patient or, you know, and it, when you have silence like that, you think it's last 10 minutes, but it probably wasn't more than a minute or so. But anyway, but it felt like forever. But his response to me was, he said, well, I'd like to tell you a couple of stories. And his first story was about when he was in college and was stopped by uh, the police. And uh, he said, you know, he went through his mind, his taillights were working, he had his, you know, the, um, his father owned the car, he had registrations and, you know, he didn't, couldn't figure out what, why he was stopped, but he was stopped and frisked and questioned and told to, you know, get back in the car and drive away and be careful what he drives in this neighborhood. He said, you know, this was probably a good 15 years ago. I don't, I'm not sure how old he is, but I'm guessing at least that long ago if he, when he was in college. And he said, you know, I didn't even think about it at the time. He says, that's just the way it is. You know, uh, that's that's the norm. You know, if you're a black man, you've got to be careful where you drive. And, and he said, um, I'm ashamed to admit that now that I that I didn't speak up or say something, but he said, maybe I'm alive because I didn't. Right. You know, and, but, you know, but he, he was regretting that he had, did not, you know. So that was his first story. And he, he wasn't asking me for a comment. He was just sharing this as his experience. And then this the second story, he has a seven-year-old daughter. And he said she came home from school um, one day last year and uh, said to her mother, what can I do to make my hair straighter and blonde? And, you know, and I am just practically in tears with this child, you know, and that's, that's one of the things that's really sensitized me to how we've created norms of what's the better, you know, and if you don't fit in, then something isn't right. Um, you know, and that's so why I said to him, John, I said, you know, this, this, I said, I don't know what to say to you, except that, you know, it, it just, there's just good examples of, of what you carry with you all the time. And I don't. And I said, and I, and I, ne and I never will, you know, and, and he said, I just want to thank you for listening. As that's all I needed, you know, mm -hmm. right. And he said, and he said, let's talk again soon. And, uh, and I said, and I, and so he didn't talk, and my question was about, I, I just wanted to hear about what was going on downtown Louisville from a black person's perspective. And, you know, he didn't respond to that at all. He just shared his personal experience. And we have talked several times since then and, and have had some, you know, wonderful conversations and I know a lot more about his history and how he got to where he is now and what he puts up, you know, what he deals with daily. And uh, we, both share a, a common um, deep interest and concern for the families that we work with, because we work for some, with some of the same families. 
and that is that has really bonded us and the fact that he wants to listen to me and I want to listen to him and that is so clear in our conversations um, you know he, sh he shared another story about what he went through to try to buy some property in Bullock County and you know and and he you know first was concerned with the property uh, all of a sudden not being available when he thought he had you know it was going to be a go and it was the, the second time that happened he said he said i was smart enough to realize there was something else going on with this with property in this area being available to him but you know and i thought you know i my family buys property wherever whenever and wherever they want right mm -hmm. you know so uh, i just shared that you know because you know what is it's um it's also um opened me up to to recognize you know the kinds of uh, prejudices that i experience as um a white woman in the church mm -hmm. not so much as a woman in the church you know and the and the the automatic assumptions and prejudices that i experience you know and i've said well you know that's the way it is you know and sometimes i think you know what do i what do i do beyond that say it's the way it is because i think we all have to find our ways in which we look at what is right and just and what is the dignity of every human being and their particular gifts to be used for okay. the glory of God. Yes. Thank you, Ruth. You know, uh, I could take the next 10 sessions just sharing my own experiences as an African-American in Louisville and as an African-American priest in this Archdiocese of Louisville. And it would take at least 10 sessions to go through all of the good, the bad, and the ugly of it. But um, I will say this, when I first uh, got ordained, I knew I definitely need, needed to have a spiritual director. And so I searched around and searched around and there was only one choice. And I went to him and I said, you're the only choice. If you're interested, <laughs> fine. If you're not, I'll keep looking. So he said he was interested. He's a white priest, of course. And he has been a huge blessing for me. And I would say he's been critical to uh, saving my priesthood in these 33 years. But it was not easy and it was not pretty from the very beginning as a seminarian, because at that point I was the only African American in the crowd. But I said to him in the first year of our sessions, uh, and I'm relating a lot of things, I said to him very clearly, I said, all I need you to do is listen. Okay, that's all I need you to do. I just need you to listen. I don't expect you to fix me or fix this or fix nothing else. It's what I have to deal with and live with, but I need you to listen. And we have said over and over, we African Americans in some of our other talks that uh, we just want to be heard. We've had so many experiences of speaking to things and not being heard, being ignored, being overlooked, being avoided. We just want to be heard. So when someone recently had asked me, you know, as a white person, what can I do? And I, I talk about forging relationships. And I said, if you can do nothing else, be a concern and listening ear and just let someone share. I mean, you'd be surprised how freeing that can be for them and for me. I listened to um, Ibram X. Kendi this past week from the Rochester, New York, and he was saying that, you know, how do you, how do you be an anti-racist? And he was like, you know, you need to, you know, you need to admit if you're in a business and, you know, there's something you need to say, you know, I know that I did this because, or, but you need to, you need to recognize it and, and take ownership of it. And, you know, if it involves talking to the other person, you know, to do so, but not to, you know, turn your back or brush it under the rug, but to be able to say, you know, I, I did this, you know, and, and try to resolve, you know, what the issue was. Yeah. Yes. And you know, so much of this, <clears throat> go ahead. Who was that? Oh, I'm sorry. I don't mean no, to interrupt. No, you go. Um, well, I've been sitting here wondering whether I should share this uh, brief story 
um, because you asked early on about um, personal experiences, and I can think of several personal experiences with racism, but one that really um, has haunted me for about five years, um, not long before I retired, I was driving to work at Brown Foreman, which is right there at 18th and Broadway. And back then, um, I don't know if any of you are familiar, but if you would come up 18th Street, um, you know, or down, I guess, heading south, there was kind of a funny little curve there to get on to Broadway and then the, to get back, you know, to the next, if there was like a little jog, now it's been fixed. But a lot of times you'd get stuck in the middle of the street. And um, unfortunately, I got stuck one time, you know, I was behind someone, the light was green, but by the time I, but all of a sudden I'm in the middle of the, the street blocking traffic coming down Broadway. And I saw the lights flashing, the police lights flashing. And so I rolled down my window and my hair was quite short at that time. And I have very curly hair. And um, I heard this police officer say to the other police officer in the vehicle with him, oh, another N person blocking traffic. And I was just horrified, you know, and when he came up to my car, he went, oh, and was real polite and everything. And, but I was really upset. And so I, um, I didn't confront him. I didn't have the nerve to do that, but I wrote down his name. And later, once I gathered myself, he basically let me off without a warning and told me just to be careful. And I went and back to Brown Foreman after lunch. And, but I couldn't, that whole afternoon, I was just so upset because I, um, you know, I, I can't imagine being called an N person um, and how many people have been called that over and over again. And so I called the, I found out what we were in the second district or whatever. I found out what district we were in and I called to report this man. And <laughs> because I didn't have his badge number, um, even though I had his name, um, it, it fell on deaf ears and I'm sure nothing was ever done about it, but I, I will tell you that was five years ago. And, you know, that was right around the time of, you know, Ferguson, Missouri. And, and I just thought, oh my goodness, you know, that felt very personal to me. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. sorry, but that's been something that has been weighing on me for a long time. So I just put it out there. Well, good for you. Thank you. Thank you for I sharing. Have, I have something to add to that. Um, little, like she, her hair was curly and it was black and they probably thought she was just a high yellow black person. And then when they saw who you was, oh, uh, they was really uh, uh, apologetic to you. But then with it being one of us, it wouldn't have been apologetic. It wouldn't have been apologetic. It would have been exactly like what they did to you. And it's just like Father Judy said, even Father Judy being a priest, you would think that he wouldn't encounter so much stuff, but it doesn't matter because when you're at close to God as being a priest and the color of your skin, they could care less about you being a priest. You're still black. Mm -hmm. So they will do to you whatever they feel that they want to do that they can get away with. And mm -hmm. it's just like, you know, several things that I put up with over all the years that I was at work. And, uh, but you, you either keep your job and learn to turn the other cheek or you leave. And I didn't have any college education. I got my job directly out of high school from what I had learned at school. Like I said, from holding it 38 years, evidently I did something right. But just uh, having to go to human resources and check on things about particular jobs, you know, for advancement and stuff like that. And then they, uh, she practically called me uh, a pencil pusher. 
And then, oh, oh, well, you can't have that job because you don't have any college education. Well, I know of some people that has done favors to get black people fired and then they got promoted to supervisor and off of a GED. So well, I gotta go back to school. So, you know, you just, uh, you know, I could have brought that up but it wouldn't have done any good because when you, when you rattle the cage and you know that they're doing something wrong well, they don't want you to rattle the cage because you will get, you will be uh, given a gift of either uh, demoted several years where you don't get a raise. So you got to be careful, even though you're black and you know you're stepping on toes because you know you're right. You have to be careful with that in the corporate world because you will be paid back. So, you know, you had to turn the other cheek. So. It, it, it's really hard and it still happens today that uh, what, what we do is any of our relatives or any young children that we know that will listen to us, we pass the word on, do the best you can do. Because if you really wanna be something, you're gonna go through all kinds of stipulations, but if you really hang in there and you try, you can make it. Don't give up. Thank yeah. you. Thanks, Ellen. Thank you. I don't know if, if you're hearing what, what I would also echo the, what Ellen is saying and from my own experience. I guess 99% of our whole focus in life is folk of color is survival. Mm -hmm. It's about survival. It's not so much thriving, it's surviving. Surviving the obstacles, uh, surviving the mindsets. Are you able to hear them now? Su surviving no. now. And I have my. They are able to hear you now. They are able to hear you now. Okay. Someone, yeah, someone needs to mute yes. your mic. Sandy, do you have something you want to say? Oh, no, she muted. Okay. Okay. And uh, I just wanted to add, you know, to go back to something which uh, I think ought to be disturbing. Just, you know, these types of incidences and to, the only thing that we can say, and so many of us have said this, that's just the way it is. If you take that and look at it from a historical perspective, you know, 400 years of enslavement, um, numerous lynchings from week to week all over the, the South to, for the amusement of white people, you know, um, the uh, raping of the African and African-American women by white men, sometimes multiple rapes and whenever, uh, no sense of freedom. And the only thing that could be said to stay alive is that's the way it is. Um, it's not a promising way to live life, but it's a, not about thriving. It's about what we have to do to survive. It's a sad commentary on life in these United States of America. Like Father Judy said, uh, it's a way of life. We're not looking for anybody to shed tears for us because we're strong because we are still surviving. Now, I could have just drawed up like a little bitty old raccoon with his tail between his legs and just sit there and cry where I want to. It, it doesn't do any good. It doesn't do any good because that doesn't soften me. It doesn't soften the ones that are are against us. So what I have done is just uh, when I've been called a, a, paddle, a pencil pusher or that uh, I'm not qualified because I don't have any high school, uh, I don't have any uh, college. college training. So what I do is I would just look her straight in her face, human resources, and I would say, well, thank you for your time. Have a nice day. So then I would leave. I would go to the bathroom where no one mainly went a lot and I would cry and then I would it crying makes you makes you mad because it makes you harder and it's like I don't want them to know that I'm crying I, they haven't defeated me they haven't defeated me so what you do is you wash your face get your composure together and you go back 
to your desk because you've got people that come in all day long asking, you know, for, for union people asking things or whatever. And uh, you just you just keep it together. You just keep it together because you don't mean anything to them. I'm a number. I'm just a number. I'm not a person. I'm a number. So I go home at the time I'm supposed to and then come back at the time I'm supposed to. And you go, you're completely, you're watched all the time, all the time, no matter what race you are, you're watched all the time. So if you take lunch too long, you take breaks too long or anything like that, you're, you're being watched. So we have to do the best that we know to do to keep our job and also to prove an element to someone else that they may possibly hire in the future that is black. So you just stay on your toes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's about survival. Can I say something? Yes. Brenda again. You know, I watched the first half of the black church and I was amazed at the power and the strength of African-Americans. I don't think whites could have handled any of that. And, <laughs> and how the white people took so much trouble to take things out of the Bible, to just mess with black people. It's just, it made me infuriated too. And mm -hmm. the fact that Jesus became their role model is perfect. I was so impressed. I did cry. It was a beautiful, I can't wait to watch the other two hours. But the strength and the power of the African, oh my gosh, you surpassed me my whole life. I can't believe you're still going and working and I'm with you. And still part of a church that made you stand and sit in the back rows and wait to go to communion till all the white people went to communion. That was reality not that many decades ago. I mean, there are women alive that I've been in groups with who had that experience and they were little children and they were made to wait in the back. I can't even imagine that in a church. Well, this is, uh, Ellen, this is Ellen again. I asked my dad one day, I said, why are we sitting back here? And uh, it was in St. Joseph, but it was like years ago, my mom passed in 1994. So there was a fire that happened at St. Monica's church. So we went to St. Joseph and also that's where my mom's funeral was. But I would wonder sometimes, I, I'd ask him, I said, why are we sitting back here? And then when I get home, he would say, that's where the black people sat. That's the only place you was allowed to sit. And then I also saw on that black program with the churches that you either sat out, sat back there, or you sat outside, not inside the building. Right. But it is known as the bullpen. That's what it's called. But that was the area that only blacks could was allowed to sit. So when I would go to St. Joseph's Church periodically, sometimes on holidays, if there was a wedding or something like that, I made sure I didn't sit back in the bullpen. Because I'm supposed I'm supposed to sit up here just like everybody else, and if they don't like it, then I'm sorry, just to scoot over. I just need a little bit of room because my butt isn't that big. But I would make sure that I did go to the middle of the church, not the bullpen. Well, let me just share this with everybody. Um, there were six of us in my class, class of 1987, and we had uh, three different ordin ordinations that year. Uh, we were not ordained all six together for a number of reasons. I specifically requested to be ordained at St. Joe's in Bartstown, because I said they need to see this black face on the altar of this church because of the history of black folk being relegated to the back. So I was ordained there in, up front, okay, laid down on the floor in front of the altar, got ordained and stood up there with the rest of the priests for the rest of the mass. So I, I told them, you know, it's about time that we write a new page of history. So let me write it myself. Father, may I ask you a question? Yes. Uh, and I, you know, I'm a devout Catholic or I, I claim to be, but um, has it gotten, is it been any easier for you in the Archdiocese of Louisville as time goes? Do you see any progress? The only thing that has made it easier for me is I retired. I'm serious. That's the best thing I've done for myself is that I can recall that I'm retired. The same stuff is still going on. I just can now freely distance myself from it. I hate to still hear about the incidents of it in some areas. It's gotten even worse. Um, I don't personally, I don't have a lot of hope that 
it's going to get any better for African Americans in this diocese anytime soon. Oh, I'm so sorry. That makes me sad. Well, I used to belong to St. Monica's years ago. I'm now uh, baptized into a different religion, but still a Christian. But now St. Monica's is no longer a black Catholic church. It's multicultural. Mm -hmm. So the, the culture has been removed just as from what we see, culture seems to be re being removed slowly from history period. Mm -hmm. There's a series, uh, I won't go into the details, but I can tell you um, that there's a series of very unfortunate incidences that the black Catholic community was put through by the white leadership which has driven a lot of the black Catholics away from the Catholic church. I mean, unfortunate. I'll just say that, just unfortunate, but truly in my mind, deeply racist. But are you talking about Louisville church or the United Archdiocese. States? The Archdiocese, okay. Archdiocese of Louisville. And isn't that the last 30, 40 years or is it longer than that? For myself? Uh, the, the pattern you said of driving people away. Oh, no, that goes back for many, many years. Um, yeah. Even um, in um, some churches that are still remain like all black. Um, before Vatican II, for example, um, many of the, I know where I grew up in the deep south, the, which was uh, legally segregated, the black parishes were run only by missionaries. The diocesan priests were white, were in the white parishes and all the black parishes were given to missionaries. One of the problems that, um, one of several problems was to be Catholic, we had to, first of all, um, we had to abandon our sense of any cultural expression, especially as a convert, because I'm a convert. My faith and my spirituality was born in the Methodist church, not in the Catholic church. Uh, I was told I basically had to put that aside and learn how to be this Romanized Catholic person, you know, sitting at mass in Latin, which I, I, I never figured it out, um, you know, but do, that's what we were supposed to do. And uh, I'll just tell you a little side one, when, when the priest, if some of you may, some of you may remember this, but, uh, when the priest would turn around every now and then and he stretch his arm and say the Dominus Vobiscum, and then he'd go back and do the prayers and then he said Dominus Vobiscum. Well, as a child, I was trying to figure out what that meant. And so in my own mind, I figured he's just turning it around to check and see if we're still there. <laughs> that was the only sense. <laughs> Nobody explained anything. We were just told this is how it is. This is what you do, okay? So um, uh, many of the African-Americans uh, moved away from the Catholic Church because they didn't have any freedom of expression to develop their own spirituality and their sense of, of, of relationship with God. And pre-Vatican II, I never heard anybody even talk about personal relationship with God. Yeah, that's true. You know, yeah, way back then. So that was one reason. There's some other reasons too, but uh, the other one is, is, you know, how much as I saw, the Catholic Church was just as segregated as the rest of the society in the South, which I didn't understand what kind of religion is this. Okay. okay. John, I just want to go back to your opening statement, though. In the Archdiocese of Louisville, yes. your response to, I think it was silly, was that they've done a lot to drive people away in recent years. Is that what you're saying in the Archdiocese of Louisville? Yes, ma'am. Yes. That is what I'm saying. Okay. I mean, thank you. you. Go to the West End churches and talk to people. Yeah. They feel they feel not heard, and there are some you know there are some issues that um, they have not had a voice in. Sure. Um, and if I, I guarantee, well, I don't know this for sure, but but in my East End mm -hmm. parish, I feel like I would at least feel like I had a voice. You know, and I don't think that's um, the way it is from the people I know. I don't know that many, but the people I know don't feel, yeah. they don't feel important. They don't feel heard. One of the things uh, that I've spoken in a number of occasions about is um, as much as the, in the church circles, they talk about um, losing our youth, youth people, young people not going to church, 
um, not coming to church, et cetera, et cetera, particularly in our African-American parishes, <clears throat> I said, you should think about the fact that their parents and their grandparents spend their whole lives involved in the church, supporting the church, participating in the church, faithful Sunday after Sunday. And over the years, what do they see? Their parishes get closed, their schools get closed, no matter how hard they work, no matter how much they invested, and they had no say so on those decisions that were made. So young people are looking at that and said, I'm not going to subject myself to the same kind of treatment that you've done to my parents and my grandparents. You know, and you know, leadership should take a serious look at that. Exactly what you're saying, uh, Father John, is because years, you know, there is a uh, stained glass windows that have names of specific families that did a lot for church, you know, maybe not everybody could afford a window, but I know one window is the Lydian family and, you know, the relatives that have worked hard to have the church built because if we didn't used to have a church, what had happened was you had it uh, at what used to be the old Kroger building. But um, like during the week, it was transferred to a school with a coal stove in the middle of the room. And then on the weekend, you transferred it over so it could be a church. But I have been questioned by my sister sometimes, why do you stay at St. Monica's? And I tell them, you know, for right now, I still feel a sense of being there. And I know that our family year after year, a lot of our relatives have done so much for the church to keep it going like it is. And sometimes um, I do question that myself. Right now I'm still there, but I've been on about just about every committee that we've had at the church, including St. Monica's used to have a credit union. And that was unusual for a church to have a credit union. And I was a member of that and helped Miss Crow do the books and all that. Well, it got to the point to where we had to close it. But anyway, there's just a lot of family history there. But then when you go to church now and you look around, most of the people that have made St. Monica's be what it is, a lot of them have died. Mm -hmm. And then a lot of their relatives, they've gone to other parishes, no longer Catholic because being ran away. So right now, I'm still there for right now. I'm only on one committee right now, not anymore. But I know people know that I'm a doer. I don't just talk about it, I'll be about it. So I have had several people come to me and they say, Ellen, you need to, why don't you talk to so-and-so and tell them so-and-so, like, how come we can't do the hymnals or different things? Or how come we're not able to do the, the funerals like we would like to do? And then I just look at them and I say, you know, I'm only one person. Mm -hmm. And even if I did speak up, I can't speak up for every situation that you all are going on, got going on. So what I do is I just keep silent because it's not going to do any good. There's power way bigger than me and I can't do it alone. So it's like you're turning the other cheek and, and you're not speaking up. Well, I feel that my presence or my money that I still give to St. Monica is, is good enough because that's all I can do. I can't mm -hmm. fight. I hold Louisville Archdiocese that owns St. Monica's Church. I can't fight that. So I just do what I can do. And then when they come to me, I just say, hold it. Uh, you need to do this yourself because I can't do it by myself. There you so, go. You know, alone. Ellen. I leave it I'm alone. Not, yeah. Well, I, feel, I feel like that. And I know Susan had, or somebody had just said it a few minutes ago as, as a woman in the church. And, and I've struggled. And I don't know why with the pandemic, I guess, because I, you know, you have time to think when you're not doing anything else. But, you know, I thought about that too, as a woman is why, why am I, why do I stay? Mm -hmm. And, and I, and I talked to my spiritual director fairly often about it, but, but if I leave, you know, who, who is gonna, who is gonna be there to voice or to help with change? And even if I'm not, you know, in the, in the, in the forefront of everything, you know, I can make, if I leave, then the kids who I minister to, how are they going to, how are they going to learn or how are they going to see change? So, you know, I agree. It is, it is hard. Um, you know, if you're, you know, African-American or whatever, you know, it, it is hard. And, and I just want you to know that you're not alone in questioning, you know, why do I stay? But I think it's important to stay for, for future generations to see that, you know, that you, you know, you were there, that is change for you staying, that is change. So, 
So, and I've got two questions to follow up with um, from somebody in the call. Um, do we uh, do we know how? I know Archbishop's getting ready to retire soon, but do we know how he's dealing with this white fragility situation? Um, and do you think the problem is throughout the hierarchy or just in general congregation? General congregation, meaning just people, just the people. Oh no, it's 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 the dominant culture. Yeah. It's it's the dominant culture, which is all of the above, actually. Um, you know, the uh, the leadership of the archdiocese is almost all white, except for and that turn is at with the office of multicultural ministry and uh, Lisa Gonzalez with the um, uh, Hispanic ministry, but all of the power people. Okay, they either will either make the decisions or facilitate the decisions that are being made are all white. This is all part of the dominant culture. Um, so I don't, and I, this is across the board. This is um, across the board in terms of the Catholic church in the United States. I've ministered in many, many dioceses across the country. Um, the one, every now and then you can hear a, uh, a, a story about something good that has happened in the midst of this that we're talking about. There was one African-American parish in Diocese of Pittsburgh, St. Benedict, I ministered there over the years many times. And the decision was made to merge them with two other parishes. And of course, they were not a part of the decision-making or the process, they were just told you needed to merge. And obviously it didn't work out. It was all kinds of problems and all kinds of, of issues and tensions, et cetera, and frustrated people on all levels. And then the current bishop went to the people of St. Benedict and he, he celebrated mass, but then he sat down and he didn't talk, he listened to them. And after the bishop listened to them, he pulled that parish out of that merger and designated it as a separate parish so that they could maintain their own cultural identity and they could celebrate and pray and worship in their own authentic cultural sense. That's a, that doesn't happen everywhere. I mean, this is the only bishop I ever heard that even did something like that, that I've been around. Father Judy, you are right. It, it, it has to take a miracle because see right now we're merged with St. Thomas and okay. Right now, uh, we have one, one uh, Father Jason is our priest, but <sighs> I'm not afraid to say this, but we're afraid <laughs> we're gonna be exactly like, we're not St. Thomas, we're St. Monica's, and we want to stay St. Monica's, but I'm really afraid that we're not going to be able to stay St. Monica's because so many ways of what is St. Thomas's ways is now being intermixed with St. Monica's ways. And, you know, I know if, if people don't say anything about it, then nothing's going to be done. But like I said a few minutes ago, it doesn't do any good to say anything about it because there's people... Uh, the hierarchy is the ones that makes the decisions. And we've been told of certain, I know one uh, procedure in particular that we did not vote on, that we was told that this is the way that it's going to be. And I'm sure that there's gonna be a lot of other things come along and that's the way that it's gonna be. I mean, the people are, are livid about it, but they don't, they don't question it or anything because it, we got a, a letter saying this is the way the procedure is and that's the way we're going to do things. Mm -hmm. So I, 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 I want to take my head off for that congregation that did get to exist as one, but right now we're in with another um, parish and a, a lot of our things are being, it's just taken away. It's not existing. I mean, that one thing in particular I'm going to mention, there is a statue out on the ground at St. Monica's. Well, I usually take care of that by cleaning it up and painting it. And then I know one day when I was just playing around with it, I, I went and painted the whole thing white. And then I put a bunch of black, black, black crosses and X's and all that on it and I left it. So of course the lady across the street that watches everything called a guy that knew that they would find me. And he called me and he said, Ellen, um, somebody's complaining about the statue. And I said, I know they would. 
I said, I painted it that way just to see if somebody's actually looking at it. So <laughs> I went down and I corrected that statue and I gave it a, a light color tan face and painted this garment. Well, here recently, there was somebody that came up with the idea that that statue needed to be black. And so it was, oh, oh, that's wonderful. Come down and paint that statue. And the white lady came down and painted the statue black and it went just fine. But if it had been me to paint that statue black, I would have been uh, ripped up one side and down the other. So there's another thing, it's, it's dominancy. My person wanted to paint it black, it got to be black. So let me paint it black, it wouldn't have been so pretty. Mm -hmm. uh, Roy yeah. or Cece Burns, do you have something you'd like to say? Yeah, um, I was just wondering if anybody knew of yeah. any cities or even other countries that had racism and really did a, a decent job turning it around. I, not that I am aware of at all because uh, you know, this whole construct of racism is something that's clearly defined by this American history. Okay, um, this, is, um, this is a country where uh, it wasn't just colonized like some of the co other countries around the world by uh, Europeans. They didn't just colonize here, they came and they basically wiped out you know, 500 nations of the indigenous people and took over and set up this whole construct. And, uh, you know, all of this, uh, I, I'm not aware of any, any country anywhere in the world that has this whole social and systemic structure of racism that we have in this country. John, Judy, I wonder if you wouldn't have been apartheid in South Africa. That's where the white people came in in South Africa and mm -hmm. took over and mm -hmm. governed. And now, of course, that's been uh, broken down. But that's another example of it, of what yeah, happened it, here. It was, it was structural to some degree. But the thing is, the difference is that they didn't wipe out the indigenous people. That's a big, big difference there and and they didn't import uh, millions of, of uh, slaves from somewhere else to come in and, and to build their economy on it they didn't do that either that that's a big difference right there i will say uh, south africa is a model for us when you think of the reconciliation that that desmond tutu and his group did and there are wonderful books about that um i mean we have probably a bigger, big. we definitely have a bigger problem, a more ingrained um, systemic issue. But um, we, we read an article by Brian Massingale, the priest that's so um, vocal about just, just Christ and racism and how racism is just not consistent with, with Christianity. And um, he calls racism a soul sickness. And almost every article or book he writes, a, a good part of the book is about the prayer that has to be foundational to making any change. I mean, prayer is gonna have to do it because you know we need to look at ourselves, our complicity with racism, our uh, feelings that are uh, like, maybe you're feeling uncomfortable with these conversations. Maybe you're feeling angry with some of these conversations. That's good. I mean, admit that to yourself. Part of the reason that racism is so hard to root out is we keep pushing it down and covering it up and hiding it. Um, it's really hard to deal with because we deny it. That's part of the book, the big point of the book. We deny our part in it. We deny that it exists. And I think listen to Father John and Ellen. and Ellen and Renee and even Gary who was uh, in the Peace Corps um, their stories and, and um, Lisa too I mean all of your stories really this is a systemic problem it's deep within our society and uh, we have responsibilities to address it if you read the article um, the Obama article that was on the syllabus of 
he he's a very hopeful person, as you all know. And he says, you know, we all have a responsibility to work on this and that we protest is fine if that's that's where we're called. But he said we also have to vote. And he made a big point that our voting needs to not just be on the national level, but on the local and state level. And he gave very specific examples, like it's the attorney general who decide how a trial is going to be handled, right? Um, it's the mayor uh, who appoints the police chief. So you think about those things. And so next week, our whole focus will be where do we go from here? Uh, you know, this is a tough place. What do we do next? And so you have some resources that give you some suggestions and I'll send some extra stuff to Joan. We can't do, we can't all do everything, but we can all do something. And it might be voting. It might be joining organizations like the Louisville Urban League or NAACP or really organizations where black people call the shots and we are, we are advocates you know, and we learn and we listen. So we really can make a difference, but it's gonna be long and it's gonna be hard and it's gonna be slow because it's a big issue. And it's real easy. I mean, I, I agree the church has some serious racism problems, but I look at the church as all of us. That's the only reason I'm still in the church as a woman because mm -hmm. I feel very disenfranchised, but I feel very much connected to everybody through the Eucharist. So I don't wanna leave. You know, I want, and I want to, I don't see that we're going to have change in my lifetime where we're going to have a voice and leadership, though we have one woman on the synod, but, um, but I feel very connected to all of you and to people because of Eucharist. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but do think about where, where am I in this equation? How do I benefit from racism? How do I comply with racism? What can I do to make some changes? That's how this book is going to really make an impact. Uh, Roy, did you have something else you wanted to add? Well, I, uh, I had a kind of a follow-up question. Um, so is racism present in the world Catholic Church? Because I, I understand how our U.S. history has it so ingrained in our culture, but and I, I don't have any experience outside of the U.S., but if anybody di did, is there similar racism in the Latin American church or European church or Rome or um, other places? Well, I can tell you what I have seen. I've, I've been, uh, I've ministered in maybe about seven or eight countries around the world. What I have seen and primarily in countries where there's been uh, colonization and uh, missionaries is not so much that it's the same type of systemic and structural racism in the society, but there's very clear evidence of missionaries and colonists who come into these countries who are products, uh, especially from the US, who are products of this uh, dominant white culture. And so they bring their their biases and their prejudices and all of that with them. That's some of the baggage that they bring with them while they are supposedly going there to preach the gospel to people of other nations. And if I could add, color is a global concept. I mean, whether you're in Brazil or you're in India or you're here in the U.S., dark-skinned people tend to be oppressed and lighter skinned people tend to be dominant. And I mean, that's just a global construct, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, there's the recent um, information about the Indian women in the subcontinent of Asia that they um, try to make their skin lighter. And there's a lot of products to do that and how, how painful it is for, for women who have darker skin in India. So yeah, there, there is, there is that, yes. Let me just make a quick comment, um, speaking not just to those of, uh, of color in the, in the Catholic Church, but also women or anybody else that feel disenfranchised for any reason. Um, 
I think there comes a time when maybe a distinction needs to be made between love for the church and love for your faith. Mm -hmm. And uh, if anyone asks me, why am I still mm -hmm. a Catholic? It's mm -hmm. love for my faith. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not one that's gonna jump up and say the Catholic church loves me or has showed me how it loves me, but I love my Catholic faith. And that's what keeps me here even in retirement. The traditions, the Eucharist, the, yeah. yes, the connection. Yes. Foundational spirituality in a relationship. It's, it's the, the survival mode for, for me, okay? I stay close, as close to Jesus as I can to survive all of this. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. Um, there was a man and lived in our neighborhood and his name was Warren. And just because he was a person of color, they wanted to get him out of the neighborhood. And he, he was a, a hoarder but he had a tree fall on his house and then uh, it leaked. And so I had some volunteers and we cut that uh, tree off of his roof. Uh, but then water came through his kitchen and then they called the uh, health department and the health department uh, told him that he had um, five, no, seven days to get out of the, clean everything out of the house or they were gonna send him to the um, downtown to the housing unit. And so anyhow, then he came to me and he said, Donna, look what I got. And so I showed him, I said, well, this is really serious. And so uh, he said, well, this is, and people told me, Donna, forget it because it's impossible. You're not gonna be able to clean a house out of 40 years of stuff. And he was a hoarder. He had stuff from the uh, floor all the way to the ceiling. And he would go to this, uh, when they had the project pickup and he would always, collect pewters and all that stuff in books and he would take everything home. So anyhow, I, I said, well, we'll fight it. I said, this is really serious. We got to do something. So uh, I prayed about it. And then I had the corrections crew. They always helped me a lot. And so the corrections crew gave me, um, I talked to the head guy and he gave me uh, 12, 12 men and uh, they had to wear a double mask. And we went in there, then I talked to different uh, uh, government officials, and I got double uh, trailers of u haul it so we could throw the trash in. And we emptied that house in two days. And then we had to clean it. But my main point is, is like Joan was saying, you know, we got to stay in there and keep fighting. And when we know we're right, just don't, just don't take no for an answer, but just to give it all we've got to make a change because we've got to. We've got to stay in there and make that change. Yes. Yeah. What a productive, love way to help, you know? Yeah. Jody? My name's Jody. You. Thank you all for sharing. I've learned just so much listening. I, um, I do want to let you know something that's really very positive, you know, that's going on um, right now at one of our schools. And, um, and when we talk about, you know, just keep fighting after our second Zoom session, I actually called our head of school and I asked about the curriculum. I asked about, you know, what, you know, in history and social studies, what, what the children were going to be learning and express my concerns. And um, they, she actually said that the archdiocese had just met and that they were going to revise the curriculum because it had been three to four years old. So, you know, it's a small step, but um, I, f I do feel like she listened, you know, and my voice was heard. But um, so one other thing I talked to her about was um, I, I, our school is small and, um, and we're very, we, we have great diversity at our school. It's wonderful. But on the main campus, not so much. And they're very, they're talking about it and they're very much aware of it. And I don't know if, all the Catholic schools are doing this this week, or if it's just um, Holy Trinity, but they're doing something that says everybody counts. And it's going on all week this week. And every day they have a speaker and they have a Q and A. <clears throat> they have it from pre-K all the way to the eighth grade. And um, there is, um, I don't know if you all are familiar with Dr. O.J. Alika. 
And um, he okay. is um, he is actually going to be speaking with the students via Zoom and they'll have time for Q&A. And he's going to be speaking to the children about social justice. I had an opportunity to listen to a lot of his work this past week once I received the communication. And I really encourage you to do the same. But but I in the with everything going on, you know, we have a long way to go. You know, you're right. And but but I I but I also want to think that you know we can make a difference, and um, that it's it's one it, it's little small things, you know, that we can do that to to turn this you know turn this train around. So anyway, I just wanted to share that with you because I I I think it's a wonderful thing. And, you know, I think that the more we hear about these things and the more we can share and so that there is some some goodness and a glimpse, you know, a little, you know, a speck of light in the whole grand scheme of things, I think, you know, is is encouraging. So yeah. keep praying. Right. And keep on going. And yeah. keep, keep supporting like Donna gave the example of how you can help one person. Mm -hmm. That's beautiful. And, and uh, also Sacred Heart Schools are doing a lot around mm -hmm. racism. I don't know half of it, but I know we attended a Zoom about redlining and one about having difficult conversations. And that's right. just a very many. They are doing lots of stuff. They had Father John and Annette Turner come. They have uh, people come, people are working with them from U of L's multicultural center. So there are some very concerted efforts being made in certain places. Yeah. Uh, Jody, how do you spell Dr. Olika's last name? It's um, it's O L E K A, Dr. Okay. O J Olika. He Thank actually you. was his undergrads from Bellarmine. And I think I forgot where he received his PhD, but he was voted by Louisville's Business First as one of the, he's really young. He's young. Uh -huh. One mm -hmm. of the top under 40, top 40 under 40 or something like that. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Thank you. Sure. Uh, Roy? Um, Joan, this time it's Cece. Okay, Cece. I just want to say something I think is really, really important. And sometimes e even as a mom, um, I've got to remember this is right now what we may all we may be doing is planting seeds but we got to keep planting them we may not see their fruition in our time but it will happen we've got to just hang in there and not give up because it's not immediately happening um, we've got to remember you know, that may not be our role to see it come to, to fruition. Our role may be to fertilize the ground and get those seeds in there. And the next generation, or maybe like our kids, my husband and my kids are the ones to start carrying it further. Because um, we, we've already said this is so big and the layers are so deep. We can't, you know, we can't undo it in a year or a couple years. It's, but we've got to make it be a continual process. We can't stop. We can't stop. So we, we got to just keep going. Yes, thank you. Amen. Thank you. All right, we have about uh, five minutes left in our, I guess, our normal time frame. So I just want to give it to Susan and Father John for those who have to jump off at 8.30. I don't know if there's anything else you want to add. Okay. Um, I just wanted to read what Marissa put in this chat. I agree, Father. It's the Catholic faith that gives me hope. And we have to be okay with disagreeing and making folks uncomfortable. Now that is very true, Marissa, because that's what really, that's a big point that um, Robin makes in her book. We have to be, it's, it's more honest to be uncomfortable with this. Mm -hmm. And then to dig into why are we uncomfortable? And I would just say from the African-American experience, um, there's a whole lot of life for us that is always uncomfortable. Um, you know, uh, for example, I'll speak for myself. I'm, I'm happy to facilitate the book study. I've watched the, um, the Black Church, uh, both uh, part one and part two, et cetera. But it wasn't easy or comfortable for me only because 
I, as I'm watching it or we're going through this, I'm reliving stuff that I've already gone through that was very painful then. And it's not gone away, but it's, it's so I'm reliving it. Okay, yeah. now I'm, I'm, I'm happy to do it. I mean, for the sake of those who will benefit something from this, but it's not a picnic mm -hmm. to go back and to relive and to be reminded and to be reminded about how it has made me feel. And some of those uh, injuries uh, have never been healed. They're still there, okay? Mm -hmm. But it takes courage to uh, move forward together. Mm -hmm regardless of where we're coming from, it takes courage to move forward together. And I've got some courage, so I'm moving forward with you. Okay, so we're coming up on 8.30. Um, so anybody who wants to stay on, I'll keep the Zoom up until 8.45. And if you need to jump off at 8.30, um, thank you for being here. And we will have our last session um, next Monday. And if you feel like you need to leave at 8.30, that's fine, go ahead and jump off. One thing I will say, if, uh, if uh, any of you, if you've not gotten around to looking at the video on YouTube about the lie that invented racism, that would certainly be worth, it takes about, about 16 minutes, I think. It's not very, very long. The lie that invented racism, you can pull it up on YouTube. If you've not watched that, I recommend that you uh, check that out before our next session. John, is that on our uh, resource paper? I don't remember seeing that. Is it on there? Uh, if it's up for I next week, I haven't looked. I don't think so. The we lie that invented the racism. lie that invented racism. Okay, yeah, thank and, you. And it's, and it's by John Bywen, B I E W E N. And yes, it's a TED talk. Carmel just said, "Is it a TED talk?" Yes. So if you if you Google TED talks. The lie that invented racism. It's excellent. I'll send that link to Joan too, so she can send it out to everyone. It's it's excellent. I, someone mentioned so um, one thing speed. I wanted to. Sorry. Hang on. Go. Ahead. Is that Jack? Yeah, I, I was just questioning, wondering. Think Cicely mentioned sowing the seeds for the next generation to proceed. Uh, from my little perspective, and I don't have a whole lot of contact with African with black people, and I, it's my problem, I guess. But not just that, but there's a lot of issues the church has that if they don't make some accommodations, there may not be a second gen next generation mm -hmm. to come along and make much difference. There's just too many things that they keep stepping in or saying things that just don't make sense, at least to me, that aren't inducive to bringing in anybody young and progressive who has different thoughts, mm -hmm. the way they look at things. I don't, whatever it may be. And if it wasn't for my, you know, the faith, there was not much reason to stay around in the social issues. The fact that it is such a social outreach, so many programs. John, I want to follow up with what you just said and exactly what you said. It, it doesn't make any sense. And, you know, because a lot of things is swept under the rug. And unless we're actually bringing a lot of these issues to life, nobody would ever know about them. So probably a lot of things that you all have heard since you've been in this book review that never even thought about, for one thing, you never thought about it because you're white, you'll never be black. But a lot of issues that we are bringing up is, is true. It's been swept under the rug and until somebody gets that rug and shakes it out, then it's gonna be more and more issues that's gonna be swept under the rug. But we're talking about issues that we've personally gone through, I personally have seen, I personally know about. But uh, like I said, you turned the other cheek because you, uh, you just, it, like Father said, it's a way of existing. You're just mm -hmm. trying to exist. And then mm -hmm. the more the more you think about it, the more stressful it makes you. And then just right now I have a headache because my head is just pounding because mm -hmm. you wanted to work out so, so much, but it's not going to. And I know that, the, that they said that we can sow the seeds, but I'll be glad to drive down uh, 
uh, I 65 as fast as I can with all my windows down, blowing all kinds of seeds out because like I'm 60, <laughs> I'm 62, will be 63. And in my lifetime, there's not, I will not, a change will not come uh, about, but, you know, I'm glad we're talking about it. And, uh, you know, like I said, don't, don't feel bad for us because we're survivors, right. but we're just telling the truth. We're just mm -hmm. exactly yeah, telling the truth. And sometimes when you talk to a, okay, say that you have a conversation with another white person and they've got some prestige to where they could get hold to some contacts that you're not able to get hold to. And they may talk to you about, yeah, I agree with you, I agree with you. But one thing you have to also consider is they're not gonna talk to other white people about it because you're gonna be uh, marked as, what are you doing talking to those black folks about situations like that? You need to leave well enough alone. So you will, we, you know, there is situations that I've come up across my own self personally to where even though you talk to a white person about it and they agree with you, but they're not dare gonna say anything about it because then you will be out of that circle of friends that you have. So yeah. that's another thing that, that that's a point too there. That's what uh, Robin says in chapter 10 that she entitled the rules of engagement. Right. Yes. That's exactly what it is. Yes. Mm -hmm. I think Maureen is trying to say something. Unmute. Mar Maureen. Well, I may be completely off topic, but when we're talking about youth in the Catholic Church, does anybody else find it very curious that um, the Catholic high schools, the Catholic grade schools are packed, but the Catholic churches aren't packed. That, that <laughs> these children are not, are young adults. They're not getting married in the Catholic church. They're not, you know, it's destination weddings. It's, I mean, does anybody else find that very interesting? And for the most part, our Catholic schools are pretty segregated. I don't know. I just think it's interesting. Yeah, I think that's a very interesting observation. Add, add to that, if, if you uh, read, this is even prior to pandemic, uh, I would read the obituary uh, section because I just happen to know so many people and I don't always know when someone passes away. And prior to pandemic, I see more and more obituaries where there are decisions are being made not to have funerals. Yeah. Or they'll say funerals at a later date, which means it's not happening at all. Or private burial with the family members, which is probably nothing more than the interment, not much prayer, whatever. That Add that to what you're describing, Maureen. It's all there. Maureen, I'll say as a, as a mother of two um, Catholic students, and they're both in their 20s now, they're in college, but it, I, I'm not from here originally, so it was almost a culture shock for me when my oldest son turned three years old, and immediately people asked me, well, where is he going to go to school? And I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, he's three, right? <laughs> And so at that point, of course, my husband at the time was Catholic and we we're both cradle Catholic. And, and uh, he goes, well, they're going to Catholic school. I mean, there was just no other choice. And I'm like, okay. So I just kind of followed the lead and visited a few schools and, and uh, we kept them in the Catholic school system. Uh, except my younger son, he had some learning differences. So uh, he went to Meredith Dunn for middle school. Uh, but we immediately found that St. X had some really good resources for him and smaller class sizes. So uh, my older son was already there. Well, he comes home several times <laughs> from school. They are completely frustrated with the fact that they have to pray before or before the start of every single class and they have three lunch times. So they have to pray before each of those lunch times, even though they're not in lunch, they're praying over the intercom for lunch. And so 
if you think about it, he has 10, he has <laughs> had six classes, a lunch and like a planning period. So eight times plus opening of school, nine times a day. And then at the end of school, 10 times a day that they did a prayer. He was, and I, I'll say this, I think my children were just overwhelmed and basically desensitized to, the, to going to church because they did church once a week or, you know, mainly on name days uh, or at certain celebrations, they would have mass in the gym. With that many students, 1,300 boys in one gym, do you think they got a lot out of that? <laughs> it's just, it's, it's not, and well, then they had to go to religion class, okay, and they talk about issues in the church and stuff, but they don't, they're not, there's no, I guess they're trying to set an example, but there's, but, but foundationally, it's up to the parents. It is, and I is. had to fight tooth and nail. I can't fight praying ten times a day. How do I get my kids to go to church? I I gave up. I honestly did not know an answer of how to get my grown children to mass, and so. I stopped fighting and I thought, well, they're getting prayer at school. And even though it was over the top and I even said something to, I was good friends uh, with the president at the time, Perry Sangali, God bless him. Um, I said, why do they have to? I said, this is really affecting our attendance at church. So, I didn't have an answer. I, I couldn't I couldn't force my kids to go to church. <laughs> I don't and know that I have an answer for that, but um, I just received in today's mail Father uh, Bishop Barron's new book on uh, for parents, how to get your children back in the church. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I need a copy of that. We need to we need to hook you up with that book. Can I? Yeah, yeah. There, you go. there you go. Let's do it. Hey, another book study. <laughs> <laughs> well, I haven't read it yet, but I I do love B Bishop Barron. I think he he gets his uh, you know he's all about evangelizing and uh, you know I think maybe that is that that's that uh, generation Y or younger you know that we really do need to evangelize with and I don't know how to do it yet. But I'm hoping the book will give me. Well, I, I even in their younger days, I uh, did youth groups. Um, uh, being my my middle schooler at the time was at Meredith Dunn. Uh, we went to Jones uh, Youth Group at the cathedral. Thoroughly enjoyed their program. Um, still didn't make him stay in church, but you know. Uh, for the time that we, through middle school, that I could get them to go to church, um, it was good. But our specific parish did not have a, a very strong youth ministry program. Um, you know, it was, it just fizzled, you know. Carmel says, don't give up. Kids often come back. And I think that's true. When kids have kids, they come back. I taught middle school and I, kids love religion class, I found, in middle school. They love talking about God and spiritual things. But I, I don't know the answer to keep them in church. But I do know they're spiritual beings and they have spiritual needs just like we do. But my, I have three children, adult children. Two of them, went, I mean, they all went to church with us every Sunday. Two of them don't go to church at all anymore. One is Episcopalian. But all their kids went, well, one of them, their kids went to Catholic grade school, Catholic high school. And my daughter's son goes to St. X. Um, and the kids don't go to church. 
So what you know, what are you gonna do? I mean, they're in their fifties. I mean, they're not kids, they're adults. Um, and you know, there's reasons they don't go. Um, my one daughter specifically because we want to go back to the LGBTQ issues and everything and all that. And but it's just a different such it's just a different world. Mm -hmm. I mean, they couldn't go to church any more than that. Maybe we weren't a good example. I don't know, but it just didn't work out. One one thing that I said. To one thing I've said to many parents who have talked to me about the same issues is that as the parent, what's critically important is that you gave them a faith foundation. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, as adults or maturing adults or developing into adulthood, they're going to have their own journey. They're going right. to search in their own direction and they'll make their own choices. Right. But the main thing is they have a faith foundation mm -hmm. to stand on or to fall back on. Yeah. Right. You know. And I and I, I totally believe that they have to make their faith their own mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. I don't know if if it was just a college thing and you know you you go about for me myself um, that you discover where you stand in, in the world. Yes. And I had pressure from a uh, a fundamentalist uh, Christian group, I'll call it. I had pressure at the time in college to be baptized, that I was a sinner, I, you know, cradle Catholic. I was baptized as a baby. Well, I, I just had a hard time believing that I was that bad of a person that I had to be baptized again. Mm -hmm. And um, anyway, and in a transition, I, I was studying abroad and, and I, I think it probably broke my mother's heart at the time, but I said, you know, I'm going to leave the church for a while. I'm going to go figure this out. So I went to Europe, um, got involved with music is, you know, music is my prayer and music is, is how I express my faith. And so when I got to Europe and I found this phenomenal choir uh, in the Catholic church, I went back. And when I came back, I told my friends at college, I said, you can't undo the foundation that's been instilled in me. I'm going back to my Catholic roots. And that's mm -hmm. where I was. Yeah, that's what you said. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Marsha's trying to talk too. Marsha, I think you had your hand up. What did you want to add? I'm inspired by bringing it back to the conversation. My one short thing that happened to us was the opposite. We took our kids out of Catholic school and there was, um, and uh, not because we hated Catholic school, there were other reasons. I will say that it wasn't that, uh, mainly financial, um, but uh, they are the, most of the Catholic people that we knew never spoke to us. Again. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yep. Not everybody, but most. Mm -hmm. Found some salvation going over to St. Pius, which even today now is very diverse for their school. But we, it was just a whole different, St. Pius is now John Paul II. But anyway, what I have, and Joan and I went two years ago uh, to, uh, <clears throat> uh, it was my first time going to the religious, big religious conference in California. And what has inspired me ever since is that at the end, someone I never knew, uh, Sister Thea Bowman, I had no, I had no knowledge of her whatsoever. And the a person um, at, at the closing ceremony on, on the Saturday, it was a, um, she gave a whole presentation. She mm -hmm. became Thea Bowman. Mm -hmm. And they had a screen in the back about her life uh, as she talked about it. But she was dressed like the opponent. She sat in the wheelchair and gave the presentation. And then there was a choir that sang, a multicultural choir that was a part of the thing. It just, just impressed me so much. Uh, and when they finished, they gave out um, 
uh, someone was standing at the door and gave out prayer cards. Now, this is my prayer card. And I don't, where can I? Oh, there it is. <laughs> I have had it in the back of my phone in the little pocket. <laughs> hardly make out Sister Thea now from the prayer card. Um, but she, uh, it, it was like she said into the bishop, she said, I come to my church uh, fully functioning. I bring myself, my black self, all that I am, all that I have, all that I'm worth, all that I hope to become. I bring my whole history, my traditions, my experience, my culture, my African-American song and dance and gesture and movement and teaching and preaching and healing and responsibility as a gift to the church. Amen. Beautiful, beautiful. Amen. Thank and you all. Yeah, I think with that, well, that was a, a good way to, to kind of end and wrap up. Um, thank you all for staying on. Thank you, Father John and Susan, for staying on You're also. Welcome. And we will see everybody have a good week and we'll see you next Monday. Thank have you. Good night, to be everybody. With all of you. Good night. Thanks. Thanks. All of you. Thank good you. Good to be with all of you. Good night. Have a good night. So Susan, don't call for